Maria Skłodowska Curie's motherland. She was born in Warsaw at the time when an enslaved Poland was divided between three neighboring empires. Just as Poland heroically resists the invader today, so then also the Polish people had to hide their patriotic feelings. Polish children used to learn the history of their land in secret and to read Polish poetry behind closed doors. My mother, the little Maria Skłodowska, was a child of that oppressed Poland. In a foreign dominated Warsaw, she learned this great truth that was to become the motto of her life, that every obstacle, no matter how great, may be overcome by the power of the human will. It was an oppressed Poland that taught her to sacrifice all for the sake of others and for the sake of an ideal. Maria Skłodowska Curie deeply loved the country of her birth. She became French by her marriage to Pierre Curie. She lived in France and she worshipped France. Yet, till her last day, she remained faithful in her heart to the memory of the Polish countryside and of the noble life of her Polish parents. <laughs> Born in 1918, after 122 years of bondage, was especially proud of the port of Gdynia on the Baltic. It was evidence of Polish enthusiasm and creative power, of the economic potentialities of Poland. From a small fishing village of a few hundred souls, Gdynia grew in these short years between the two world wars to be a beautiful modern city of a hundred thousand inhabitants, the fifth largest seaport in Europe and the largest on the Baltic. The liner Battery, now in service as an American transport, was once a fine and modern Polish passenger ship bringing tourists and businessmen from distant lands. Ships that left Gdynia sailed the seven seas and called that port in 44 countries. Poland's tiny stretch of Baltic sea coast was in 1939 the scene of some of the most heroic episodes of this war, such as the defense of the fortified Wester Platter where a small Polish garrison held out for two weeks against the powerful German Navy. Historically, Poland grew around the basin of the Vistula River. Of the Vistula, that Marie Skłodowska Curie called My River, this is what she wrote. There is a Krakow song in which they sing, this Polish water has within itself such a charm that those who are taken by it will love it even unto the grave. Here for centuries, the Poles time and again had stopped the Germans in their age-old drive to the east. That is why so many fortresses and strongholds were built there. In their shadow are many historic landmarks, cities and cathedrals. The town hall of Świecie dates back 800 years. The Pelplin Cathedral was built in the 15th century and is 600 years old. Here is Helmno, the 10th century city with a town hall preserved in its original beauty. On the banks of the Vistula stands the old town of Torun. Its old 13th century town hall makes a quaint contrast with the boldly modernistic building that houses the local offices. 
Nicholas Copernicus, the astronomer, was born in Turin. One of the world's greatest minds, he made the discovery that the Earth moved around the Sun. That is an old nursery rhyme about Copernicus. He stopped the Sun, he moved the Earth, he was a man of Polish birth. All the world, of course, knows Venice and Bruges, the Belgian Venice of the West. Not everyone knows, however, that in a way Poland has its Venice too, the old city of Bydgoszcz, all crisscrossed by canals, a Venice of the East. The 2,000 years old construction at Biskupin is seen here, proving the Slavonic origin of this land. A thousand years ago, the Polish frontier ran to near where Berlin and other German cities stand. In those days, the Germans kept up constant attacks upon the neighboring Slavs, but the Polish king, Bolesław Hobry, or the Brave, was dreaded by the powerful German emperors. Emperor Otto III, ruler of the Holy Roman Empire, attempted to gain the friendship of King Bolesław and undertook a pilgrimage to Poland to visit the shrine of Saint Adalbert, who had been murdered by a Baltic tribe of primitive people then living in what is now Prussia. From the moment he stepped on Polish soil until he reached the shrine at Gniezno, he walked barefoot in humble pilgrim garb, trying, as did some of his successors, to obtain by guile what he could not gain by force. In Gniezno, the first capital of Poland, a monument was erected to this valiant and wise king, Bolesław Hrobry. He laid the foundation of a powerful Poland and taught his people to be always on their guard against the Teutons. Poland grew to be the greatest state in Eastern Europe. The famous oak trees in the park at Rogalin can remember those ancient days. Only seven of them are left, but each is more than a thousand years old. Poznań's town hall foundation we are laid early in the 13th century. Its mural decorations include the rampant Lion of Bohemia, a reminder that the Poles and the Czechs once lived under the same king. Poznań teaches the lesson that a conquered people should never despair. Only 10 years after Kaiser Wilhelm II built a fine new castle in Poznań, only a few short years after the Poznań Opera House had been erected by the Germans, the same opera house resounded in the 1920s with Polish music and song. Poznań became famous after the last war for its international fair, the third largest in Europe, with 25 nations participating and 3,500 exhibitors. Poznań has a Woodrow Wilson Park and a monument to President Wilson, given to the city by Ignacy Paderewski, the great Polish artist. The German invaders were to wreck it savagely in 1939. The Konik and Gowuchów museums contain fine collections of old Polish armor, pottery and rugs. of Our Lady of Częstochowa is a place of pilgrimages for all Poland and may be called her religious capital. A pope once bestowed upon Our Lady of Częstochowa the title of Queen of the Polish Crown. Ever since the 17th century, when the country was freed of invaders by a force of Poles bearing the holy image of the Virgin, a devotion of a national character has been added to the religious cult that the Polish people have for Our Lady of Częstochowa. Upper Silesia is extremely rich in natural resources, 
such as zinc ore and coal. Three quarters of all Polish coal is mined here. For a long time in history, this part of Poland has been under the German yoke. No wonder if its people put all their strength, born of bitterness and hatred, into its defense during the present war. One of the most tragic episodes of the 1939 campaign was the slaughter by the Germans of all the Boy Scouts in Katowice, capital of Upper Silesia. Zakopane, in the lofty Tatra mountains, on the boundary line between Poland and Czechoslovakia, was a favorite health and sport resort. In summer, it was the mecca of mountain climbers, while its winter sports season attracted visitors from all over the world. A few years ago, the World Ski Championships took place in Zakopane. People of this mountainous country have preserved their quaint costumes, language, and their old peasant dances. Their music, based on the archaic Aryan scale, was a source of delight to many a modern composer. To the Poles, Zakopane was much more than a health resort. It was a rendezvous of artists, writers, scientists, and poets who found inspiration in the life of the simple mountain folk, in their legends and tales, in the beauty of their unspoiled land. The Polish soldiers who in 1940 fought in France and helped to defend Norway, those who held at Tobruk and attacked at El Gazala, the Polish airmen, who played such a gallant part in the Battle of Britain, and the Polish infantry standing guard along the Scottish coast, all those patriots had many predecessors in the history of their country. For our freedom and for yours is Poland's ancient battle cry. Even when their own country no longer existed on the map, Polish soldiers were always ready to fight for a great cause. Poles fought for freedom in the United States, in Italy, in Hungary, in Belgium, the Argentine, Brazil, Peru, and Bolivia. Many centuries ago, the rulers of Poland had already given guarantees of personal and political liberty to their people. One of the outstanding dates in Poland's history is the year 1430, when a bill of rights in the form of the Neminem Captivadimus Act was written. More than 200 years before the English Habeas Corpus Act, this law guaranteed personal liberty to all and forbade arrest without warrant or punishment without proven guilt. Krakow, capital of Poland from the 14th to the 17th century, is rich in architectural treasures of that period. One of the most beautiful Gothic structures is the Cloth Hall. We might call it the first department store in the world. 
It was built even earlier than the cloth hall of Ypres. In Krakow, we also find the second oldest university in Central Europe. Tadeusz Kościuszko, who fought for the freedom of the American colonies by the side of George Washington, is buried at the royal castle at Wawel, Poland's Westminster Abbey, together with Polish kings, famous poets, military commanders, great heroes. After his return from America, Kościuszko led the Polish insurrection against the Russian Tsar. Wearing a peasant garb, he won a battle near Krakow at the head of a regiment of sturdy peasants. He is worshipped all over Poland. Not far from Krakow, in the picturesque foothills of the mountains, many health and summer resorts were built at Jagiestów and Krynica. In peacetime, the latter was an internationally known spa. Primarily, Poland is an agricultural country. Although some farmers migrate to the cities where they work at all kinds of jobs, the majority simply stay in their villages and cling to their old traditions. The Husul mountaineers of eastern Poland give us a picturesque example of local folklore. They are famous for the originality of their peasant art in ceramics and textiles. Let us go back to the warriors of Poland, to her famous soldiers. In 1683, when the Turks were besieging Vienna, when things looked hopeless, the Austrian Emperor Leopold II and Pope Innocent XI sent messages to the Polish King Jan Sobieski, begging him to come to their rescue. The King arrived at the head of his army and completely routed the Turks. In memory of this great victory, one of the star's constellations is called Sobieski's shield. Later on, Turkey and Poland concluded a pact of lasting friendship and Turkey was the only country which did not recognize the partitions of Poland. For more than a hundred years, an empty seat was kept at the Sultan's court at all official festivities and diplomatic receptions for the temporary absent Polish ambassador. To King Jan Sobieski, the Poles erected a monument in the city of Lwów, the southern bastion of Polish culture. As is often the case with frontier cities, its inhabitants are the most ardent and devoted patriots. When in 1919 Lwów was in danger of being torn away from Poland, even women and children took up arms to save the town. Some of these eaglets, as the people called them, lie in the cemetery, together with American airmen of the famous Kościuszko squadron who had come over to help save the town of Lwów for Poland. The grateful inhabitants erected a monument to their memory. The charming lakes of eastern Poland are alive with fairies, elves, imps, naiads, and other spirits born of popular imagination. Polish poets, many of whom were born in this part of the country, drew freely from these tales and legends. Now here is a true story, not a legend. 600 years ago, a young and lovely girl silenced her love for a handsome prince in order to marry a foreign old man. She was sacrificing her love for her country. The young girl was a Polish queen of French and Hungarian descent by the name of Jadwiga. She married Władysław Jagiełło, ruler of the pagan Lithuanians, so as to bring Poland and Lithuania together. As a result of this marriage, Jagiełło and his subjects embraced Christianity. Very soon in 1410, the joint armies of Poland and Lithuania defeated the Teutonic Knights of the Cross in the famous Battle of Grunwald. This victory united Poland and Lithuania and showed how a concerted effort can conquer overwhelming force.
Wilno, like the book a frontier city, was the birthplace of Polish romantic poetry. Here the great Adam Mickiewicz was born. Wilno has also many architectural treasures of outstanding interest. History tells us that when he first saw the church of St. Mary in Wilno, Napoleon said that he would like to take it back with him to France. The holy picture of Our Lady of Ostra Brahma is worshipped here as is the shrine of Our Lady of Częstochowa in Western Poland. Not only Catholics, but even Jews and people of other creeds often kneel before it. In the Rosa Cemetery, on the outskirts of Wilno, the heart of Marshal Pilsudski is buried. Pilsudski had expressed the wish that it should lay there next to the grave of his mother. Here, we see a famous stud of Arab horses in Yano. Horse breeding was developed in Poland on a large scale. Polish cavalry has played an important part in the history of Poland. It distinguished itself during the Napoleonic campaign. Puwatski, who gave his life while defending the freedom of the American colonies, was a lancer. In 1969, an impressive ceremony known as the Union of Lublin further strengthened the ties between Poland and Lithuania. The members of the Lithuanian House of Representatives journeyed to the Polish city of Lublin and there joined with the Polish Parliament in a unanimous vote for the union of the free with the free and the equal with the equal. The agreement gave both countries equal rights. It stands as a historic example of a freely accepted federation in Central Eastern Europe. The Warsaw Confederation of 1573 gave religious freedom to all. The constitution of the 3rd of May in 1791 was one of the first constitutions in Eastern Europe which took into account the will of the people. In 1794, under the leadership of Kielinski, a cobbler, the inhabitants of Warsaw rebelled against Russian oppression. Warsaw has been Poland's capital from the 17th century on. Its name is closely interwoven with Polish history. For more than 20 years after the last war, Warsaw was the seat of the Polish government and of the parliament. Here, in September 1939, the heroic Poles defended their city for three dramatic weeks. They only surrendered after all water, food, and ammunition were spent. The finest historical buildings and churches in Warsaw have been destroyed by German bombs. The great Chopin was born on the outskirts of Warsaw and studied in that city. To play his music is now forbidden in Poland by Hitler's orders. There are no Polish schools in Warsaw. There is no bread, no milk for Polish children. Every day some inhabitants of Warsaw die of starvation or are tortured in concentration camps. But in every Polish home, no doubt, in homes such as the one where my mother, Maria Skłodowska Curie, was born, someone today is teaching Polish children in secret. Someone is printing an underground newspaper. In every such home, Polish men and women are making daring plans to help the armies of their liberators of the United Nations. They silently prepare for the day when after so much suffering, so much fighting, so much waiting, they will again be the citizens of a free Poland. <laughs> 